United Planners, an RIA and broker dealer structured as a limited partnership, providing partners and associates an unfettered program to conduct fee based and commission business for over 30 years. Advisors are offered the flexibility of being independent with a broad choice of custodians under the firm RIA or their own independent RIA. Please take note that this episode of Healthy Advisor with Diana Britton includes reference to mental abuse, physical abuse, and sexual assault. Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com, and in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast, and thanks for joining me. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and wellness, and today's guest has been a um, strong advocate for, for mental health in this industry. His name is Mark Nichols, product director and uh, product director at Arbor Digital in, in Austin, Texas. Mark, thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Diana. Happy to be here. So uh, Mark is extremely knowledgeable about crypto assets and non-fungible tokens. Um, and you know that consumes much of his day to day. But a uh, little bit more about his background. Pri- prior to joining Arbor Digital, Mark started his career as a professional tennis player and coach before transitioning to financial services with Merrill Lynch in Princeton, New Jersey. And um, you know he's also started an advisory business uh, to meet the wealth management needs of clients in the New York and New Jersey market with Charles Schwab. Um, after that. But you know, if you if you met Mark, you would not have guessed the struggles and hardships that he's endured in his childhood and in his early career. And Mark, I know much of those experiences have shaped who you are today and how you think about mental health, the importance of, of therapy in, in the financial services industry. But take us back to your childhood. I know you know had a difficult one. Um, you know, sort of growing up in Southern California and then also in in Princeton, New Jersey. Tell us about your experience growing up. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, So I guess for me, I really have these three different phases, I like to call it, you know, my my beginning phase where I spent my time, you know, really just in this inconsistency phase, uh, I'll call it, um, to where there was constant movement and there was always just inconsistency and I guess I'll add toxicity just no matter where we were, right? And I guess uh, before I do that, I should say that I am a twin. I have a twin sister. Um, so that's always played a role in how I remember my experiences. And I think the big reason why I'm sitting here today in the position I am is because of having that twin sister. And as terrible as all the stuff we went through um, together, we would never would have gotten through any of growing up without each other. But yeah, so the the... The experience growing up, and the best way I can describe it, again, is those two words, is inconsistent and toxic in really every way. You know, my dad was 18 when we were born. My mom was a young professional trying to make it at 25, and already had been married and divorced by then. So, And none of my parents were educated past high school. And so the way we, we think about it today as our older selves, you know, we were kids being raised by kids, pretending to be adults. <laughs> um and, you know, we were we were always back and forth between different states in the country, different parts of California, Nevada, New Jersey. And the other thing, too, I'll mention growing up and the experience was we were back and forth between cultures. You know, my mom is Irish and my dad is Mexican. And we were always thrust into these different environments where, again, very different cultures, very different environments, different behaviors, dynamics, all of those things. So it was, it was always like we never fit into any any place ever. <laughs> and, you know, we were in pretty much two different schools every year from first grade till about freshman year of high school. And yeah, and we, I would say at least six to eight different houses we lived in growing up in that time frame as well. And we were either staying with other family as well at those times in their houses. So 
I guess that's what I mean by there was always just inconsistency. And then the toxicity just comes from, uh, you know, the unfortunate matters of being exposed to physical and emotional abuse by both sides of, of the family, which, you know, which was a big piece of our growing up. Yeah, I mean, I know it's it's hard to, you know, drudge up some of those memories where you would you share some of that trauma, some of the the emotional, physical abuse that that you went through? Yeah, and I, I appreciate you saying that. And it's important to know that it's taken a lot of work to get to where I am today to where I can actually talk about it and share my story. And, you know, I thank you for giving me this platform. And this is a huge step for me. So we're going through this together right now. But uh, but yeah, happy to share. Um, it's important to to bring light and awareness. I know it's tough to hear, but uh, I guess some of that trauma for me, and I'll speak to myself as I don't want to share, you know, my sisters or anything, you know, that's her truth to tell. But for me, you know, I was, you know, so I was raped when I was seven years old uh, by a family member. That was, that was the big event. And then, you know, just from my mom and my dad and from other people in, in both families, there was just always a consistent physical and mental abuse by everyone all the way up until I would say our, our lower 20s. And, you know, for, for my mom, on my mom's side, when I turned 14 as a growing young boy, uh, that's when the physical abuse kind of stopped on her side because, um, you know, I was strong enough to, you know, fight back, defend myself. But that's when kind of the emotional and the mental abuse ratcheted up just a few more notches. Um, because she couldn't control me physically, intimidate me in the the way she was used to. It just kind of morphed into other, we call them prisons now, uh, mental and emotional prisons we were held within. So yeah, that's, that's a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I know that, um, you know, when you were telling me about the, the physical abuse, you know, you, you were... Folks made it sound like there was something wrong with you and that you weren't telling the truth, right? And I mean, that that seems like that carried with you, you know, through much of your life. And just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, what, I, I, don't, I don't know, how did that affect you? Yeah, and I think it goes into how I view things now. You know, it's, it's really strange and you don't realize it when you're growing up. You know, these are the people that are supposed to love you and care for you. And these are supposed to be a safe space, right? And so when those traumatic events happened, you know, and I'll specifically talk about when I was seven, you know, I think the thing that really didn't hit me until later in life was how I was portrayed. Like I, there was something wrong with me. Like, why would I be saying these things? And it, and it, and at the time, I didn't know, but after learning, you know, it's just, this is a form of denial by the people who just don't want to believe that the person that they thought they knew could actually do those things. And so that's where that came from, from my mom. And so it, it created this dynamic within my parents, actually, where I had one side who didn't believe me, which is my mom, and it was her side that I had experienced that on. And, and it was almost like I had to relive the trauma just every time because just no matter until I, until I was um, in middle of high school, you know, it was still just was this denial that she just never believed me. And it was just really hard to, to go through that. And I didn't realize how hard it was and probably until later. But, you know, I think the big thing for me also was really hard was when I was a sophomore in high school, I had to relive that trauma. The person who had did that to me actually ended up getting cancer and was going through what he was going through. And then my mom in whatever mental space she was in, she thought it was a good idea to invite him over to where we lived and for Thanksgiving because it was going to be his last Thanksgiving. And I was told, and I, you know, I was basically forced to act like nothing happened. I was forced to, and if I didn't do that, I was not respecting my elders. And I think that's where for me, this idea of always respecting your elders was a little bit different than normal people because I had to go through that type of experience. And so it created as, as I'm an adult now and the way I view things, it's that whole trust but verify. Like uh, my trust is very hard to, to get. And I have these barriers for trust in the professional world as well as, you know, my personal life um, to where it takes a lot more to show me that you care for me than just words. <laughs> and so I think that's how I've taken, that's what I've taken with me into my professional life. And I think it's good and bad maybe in some ways, but um, I guess that's how it shaped me uh, today. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I'm so sorry that you know you went through that stuff as a kid and and uh, that you didn't have someone there to to listen to you and tell you that that's wrong. You know, I think for a lot of folks, uh, you know, going through something like that, so the things that you've gone through, um, you know, not just that experience, but uh, a lot of the other things, you know, they'd be in a much different place in life, you know, much darker place. And but, um, you know, after talking to you several times, you you have a really positive attitude. You have, uh, you know, a passion for for this industry, for, um, you know, helping others. Why do you think you didn't end up in a darker place than you are now? Ooh, what a, what a great question. <laughs> um, I guess I guess one important note here would be I didn't end up in a darker place, and I, I guess I'll say like I know there's a lot of things that happened completely out of my control. Like I don't I don't know if the word luck is the was what I would use, but just I know there were things that I couldn't see or feel or um, have any sort of control over that I know helped me. And so if you're listening to this and you hear my story and you played a role in helping me, like, thank you. <laughs> so I guess I'll say that, but I guess the three things I, uh, there are three things I guess I can really come up with. And the first is really my twin sister, right? And she, without her, I wouldn't be here hundred percent, right? And I think that's true for both of us. We were each other's rocks. If I didn't have that, I probably would be in that darker place. Um, the second thing I would say is sports, um, specifically basketball and tennis. Um, basketball was my first sport. Um, when I was younger growing up, um, that was really the first sport I gave to. And, you know, for me, I have the genes and, you know, I have talent, I guess you could say. So sports always came naturally to me and it was always could be my escape, right? When you're, when you're on a basketball court or you're in a field or playing a sport, like everything else doesn't matter. All that matters is the game and that you perform. And I could perform, and so I would always get this praise and love and ad adoration. And so I think that became my escape. And then also for basketball, it was the one thing that my dad and I shared that was positive. And so whenever he would want to play basketball, it was great because he could beat me in it because obviously I was like a little kid and, you know, it would make him feel superior. And then I would be able to still learn and have fun. Like, I didn't care that he won. It was like the the one place where I felt love from my dad was on the basketball court. And then when I moved to New Jersey later in life, my and you know, my my sister had introduced me to tennis, I immediately fell in love with tennis. There's so much you learn about a game as well as, you know, the process of learning very hard technical things. And I think that's what tennis brought to me. And I tennis has just been such a huge piece of my life, both professionally, mentally, physically, just I've taken so many things and it's really helped me in my financial services career, actually. So I would say that's the number two is the sports aspect. And then number three is uh, there was this integral move where we were able to move to central New Jersey, right? We, I originally lived in North New Jersey for a little bit and that was a really toxic situation. But when we moved to the central Jersey where Lawrenceville, Princeton, New Jersey, and I got to go to both, both high schools, Lawrence, and I got to graduate from Princeton High School. Um, you know, I met so many people and families who I still have a relationship with today that, you know, they were the ones that kind of had that more nuclear family. They were a lot more stable and I, I made friends with them. And, you know, everyone has their own difficulties, all families, no matter what, no matter where you are. Um, but for me, on a relative basis, they were the stable ones and they kind of showed me love and gave me gave me what it could be and what it could look like. And so I guess... I always had that optimism because I could see it in other families and I knew there was something on the other side. I just had to figure out how to get there. Wow. So I know that when you were in New Jersey, you were living with your mom and your sister. What was it like, you know, growing up in, in that all female household and how did that shape you? Yeah, it was, it was great in a lot of ways and, you know, probably not so great in other ways. And I'm going to completely speak from my own experience, right? My sister may have different thoughts. My mom will. But I guess uh, in the in the not so great ways, I mean, it was just tough because I never had that father figure, right? I never had that physical father, fatherly presence. And even if it was a toxic one, I still wanted it, right? And I didn't know the difference between, to, I just knew that I had a dad and I was supposed to, that was my dad, no matter what. I couldn't change my dad. 
Um, so I had to always want that guy. So I think that was the tough thing for me is that not just having it. And then I think what created a lot of, I guess, volatility with that specific piece with my mom was she always had, you know, boyfriends or tried to. And, you know, so there was always these different father type figures that would come in and try to fill a role or a gap. And, you know, that just never worked out. Um, I would always just and I would just, you know, I would you know, I would act out. Um, so that was the tough part. But I think the positive ways and the and the things that I really got and the greatest takeaway that I think about a lot is really just seeing women as and I, can I curse on this show at all or like worse uh, women are badass <laughs> I just you know are badass can do anything can do it with power strength and grace you know from day one and handle anything um you know I saw my mom struggle as a single woman parent trying to work and provide for a set of twins and it really set the stage for I truly and genuinely didn't have to learn all of the societal and gender norms that are imprinted onto you if I were to go through that normal nuclear family or things of that nature. Um, and so I take that with me a lot. And that that was that was huge. And I really appreciated that, um, that I got to grow up in that type of environment. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's uh, a little similar to, to what my husband went through. He was, you know, sort of raised by women. His father was never in the picture, um, was raised by his aunt and mom and grandma, basically. In any case, uh, so tell me about how you got into financial services. I know, um, you know, that's sort of a, a leap here, but how did you make it into this industry? No, I think it's an important one. And it kind of ties a lot to my story. Uh, I think that need for a father figure and so many dynamics from my younger years, you know, it really set me up to see things a certain way. And so the way I got into financial services was there was an advisor at Merrill Lynch. Uh, his name is John Abrachamento. So John, if you hear this episode, uh, I'm going to give you a big shout out here and you're going to learn just how much of an impact you had on me. But really, uh, he took me under his wing when I was at the tail end of my tennis career and finishing up my undergrad at school when I was about 25 years old. Um, you know, I had, and I think the, the way I got connected with him was again, through tennis, I had been a coach and mentor to his son, one of his, one of his children, his son, Tim, who in, in his own right is, uh, you know, such a strong person and even as a player a kid growing up in, in Princeton he was he had such a strong attitude strong and I think I really took to him as a student because of some of these qualities and then it made me look up to his dad because I was like man like your dad must be amazing if if this is how you are and you know I still had never experienced what a what a you know what a father figure was and so you know his dad was the main one to you know take him to lessons bring him here he's the main one I would talk to and you know I just learned how much of an honorable, respectful, and re well-respected person he was before I ever learned he was an advisor. And then when he took, one day, when he asked me, he's like, you know, you're finishing up your undergrad, you know, what are you going to do? And he was like, here, let me show you what I do. Let me, and he, so he brought me into his office, really nice office. And he, you know, very successful advisor at Merrill, you know, has his own group. And it was just really cool. And for me... I just thought to myself, I was like, man, if I could be one tenth as honorable as this person and this guy, and specifically as a man and as a fatherly figure um, who was loved by his family and who, you know, was so respectful to his wife and to his children, and they just had such great family dynamics, I um, immediately made the prospect of being an advisor really enticing. And it's important for me because it always helps me remember that, you know, I never got into financial services because of the money. Like the money I actually didn't know exactly what you can make until probably, you know, six months to a year after. And for me, it was just this pathway to an honorable existence. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, this this industry is is a bit of a, a boys club. Um, you know, statistically speaking, women represent just 18.1% of advisors as of 2019. And that's up from 17% in 2018, you know, small uptick there, but um, that's Cerulea Associates data, um, which is a Boston based research and consulting firm. You know, what were some of the experiences of the culture inside of financial services firms? And, and how did that impact you? I mean, I know, you know, John, um, you know, 
maybe the exception, um, but what was some of the experiences that you had inside of financial services firms? Yeah. Uh, and that's where I guess we just got to be better, right? You, you saying those statistics, um, I think it's really important that no matter where you are, no matter, no matter where you're listening from or what firm you work at, you just, we just got to be better and that's okay. It, it doesn't, you don't need to take it personally. And I think that's kind of one of the barriers is really just having the self-realization of what you can do to, to be better and it's okay and that's fine. But I guess in terms of specific experiences, you know, I've seen, you know, some really great things, but I've also seen some not so great things. And, you know, for me, I'm an optimist at heart now, right? Like I like to see the good in people. I'm very positive and I like to let that show and I like to let that be in the fabric of me and, and what I bring to the, to everyone I come in touch with and the environments I work in. Um, but I guess a, a few things I'll, I'll share in some experiences, I think, is really just those kind of norms of, I think that are still present is where I think men who, especially, and again, I'm going to generalize a little bit and I apologize for anyone who doesn't do this, but you know, there still are these things where like we expect women to pay more of those nurturing roles in the workplace, even though they are smart, intelligent, powerful, strong, and just as capable to do anything and if not better than a lot of their male counterparts and and i'll give a specific example um you know we did i used to do a lot of events you know i cared a lot about bringing education to my clients and their families and their different generations of families and two different ways i saw kind of some toxic things happen and one was you know, when I would do the events, you know, the end of the night would finish, you know, and I would always have a support staff uh, or one of my female colleagues, you know, partner up with me on these events. And I just remember one day after the end of one, you know, and one of my colleagues, uh, she was, we both stayed till the end. And when I say the end, everyone had left, you know, the office was messy, you know, food was had and all that stuff. And we were finishing up the night. And then she just looks at me, she goes like, oh, you're staying? I'm like, yeah, why, why wouldn't I? And she's like, oh, normally whenever I partner with, uh, you know, a couple other advisors in the office, you know, they, they're kind of out well before or they leave right after the last client leaves. And, you know, I, I'm usually the one that cleans up. And I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, does that happen often? She's like, well, yeah, that's kind of the norm. And I, and again, it's, it's a small thing when you think, if you think about it sometimes, but it's, it's not, it's a big thing. It's kind of this, Oh, you know, I don't do this because I'm a, a. That's not what I'm conditioned to do. Like, oh, there's a woman here. She's the one naturally who's going to take care of this. And I think that happens a lot. And my wife also works in financial services, and she's experienced her own experiences of those types of things. But just that, that kind of hit me hard, and I was like, really. And so, just in those those types of areas, be very cognizant of what you're conditioning in your office. And I guess another thing is in, in leadership as well, right? And I think, especially for what I've seen, I was fortunate enough to have a, a female leader in one of my offices that I worked in. But again, I think there was extreme pressure on her after after getting into leadership myself, you know, years down the road, I learned kind of some of the things that are expected and some of the flexibilities that are not given to women leaders and that are given to male leaders just because there's that male connection and because there's a domination, as you mentioned, 18%, I think. And I would say even in leadership, it's even lower in terms of the percentages. And you have to work, you know, 10 times as harder to be seen and heard equally. And I would just put it out there that it's a lot of it's learned behaviors that you don't actually realize you're doing. And I think that's the toxicity of it, right? And I think that there has to be more purposeful intention in making males aware of these habits and these behaviors that, again, they've learned over time that are toxic to the workplace and actually discourage and disincentivize women from wanting to actually stay in financial services and be these leaders. And it just makes me realize that any woman who is in a leadership in an executive position or is just running a super successful business in financial services, like more the power to you, like what you've had to overcome is, is, you know, is insurmountable a lot of the times and, you know, kudos to you and, and don't stop, keep going. Like they're, <laughs> it's so important the work you do. And I guess those are a couple of experiences I guess I could share. 
Yeah, and um, I mean, we've had some some women on the on the podcast talking about the things they've had to uh, overcome. I guess I'm I'm wondering, you know, uh, you know, I've been covering this industry for a long time, and and it seems like, you know, back in the '90s and early 2000s, you know, uh, there was a lot of focus on, you know, the numbers and productivity, and you know, are you meeting your hurdles, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, there's a lot more focus on holistic wealth management and financial planning and, you know, uh, talking clients through life events and things like that. But I, I mean, I'm wondering from your perspective, does that still exist, you know, in the culture that, that numbers, um, you know, that focus on the numbers? Uh, I mean, I, I know you were talking to me a little bit about that uh, when we spoke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, for me, it comes to this context of like masculinity and what it means to look like a powerful male within the industry. Right. For me, and it, it came down to those numbers. Like the first thing you would ask, like your, your colleagues or your other, you know, if you were going to other States or branches and you were traveling, you know, the first thing you asked you, Oh, like how much business are you closing? Right. And those questions like are just so empty to me. Right. It just doesn't speak to anything. Like it's such a surface level indicator of if you're actually adding value to a client's life, like to a family's life. And it's the wrong question. And one of the the challenges, I think, with these bigger firms as you know, being a part of two of the biggest uh, or three of the biggest is this idea of being results driven and numbers driven. Like when you're determining if your employee is valuable, that it has to be more than just the number you see on the balance sheet or the number. And I and I remember a specific question I asked uh, to you know a high up leadership executive within one of these firms, and I asked them. I said, "Hey, what would you deem as successful?" And, you know, because I was I was consulting at this time, um, and I was asking, "What would what would make a a successful quarter or a successful month?" And again, the the answers are always, well, if we bring in X, Y, Z number, that would be successful. And there's just all the focus is on there. And it's really, and I think there's a lot of lip service done to say, oh, we do this. But especially when you're saying we're going to provide holistic wealth management, any wealth manager in this space who actually it provides that type of value to a client and their situation and their family knows that takes a lot of time and effort. <laughs> like you can't do it in an hour or two. You can't just devote, oh, three or four hours to if you're doing these complex wealth situation and, and true holistic wealth management, which is why I think these firms are trying to do their best at providing, you know, full on teams to help them. But at the end of the day, it's it's still it's still hard. And there's still this big focus. And I think a lot of masculine traditional norms you grow up with get tied to this because when you're out and you're talking to colleagues like the first thing anybody wants to talk about is just numbers and it's like i think and from what i've learned you know and i'd love to know like have you seen like with the guests that you have on i do they the the female guests i guess i should say like from what i've learned like it that's not the first place that that the females that I've worked with that they want to go to, they want to ask, you know, you know, what was their situation like that? Those are the questions I usually get asked. And those are the questions I like to ask first, like, what was the value you provided? Like, how did you help them today? Like, what decisions did you help them make today that really set them on a course for financial success and more harmony in their life? Those are the types of questions that I think they asked me. And that I learned like, man, those are really good questions. Like, those are the questions we should be asking. So I don't know, like, I'd love to turn that back to you. Like, do you see that that same type of difference in questions? Like, that's what, because that's, I, I don't know, like. I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, it does seem like women tend to to focus more on that kind of stuff. Although, you know, that we, we don't get too much into that on, on this podcast. But, um, you know, I mean, I think it does, there is sort of a, um, a struggle at the beginning for, for women advisors in just, you know, getting to profitability. And there's, you know, sort of a focus on that because, you know, it's tough in the first couple of years, you know, to get to the profit, especially if you're an independent advisor. I just I wanted to go back to you and and talk a little bit about how you got to a place of healing, you know, after, you know, all the things you've been through. 
Um, you know, I know that you talked about therapy helping a lot. And I think that there is, um, you know, still this stigma out there, um, especially in this industry uh, uh, around therapy. And I, I think it would just be really helpful to, you know, dispel some of those, I don't know, myths or misconceptions about it. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that's such an important question. And especially in the context of financial services, or if you're a financial professional. So the first thing I'll mention is you have to be honest with what you are taking on as a responsibility, as, specifically as an advisor, right? When you're an advisor and clients look to you as their trusted resource for their financial life, you are taking on much more than just dollars and cents you are taking on the emotional well-being of people because money, if you see any of the psychological studies done around anxiety, stress, or you know toxicity in life, in relationships, always at the top of the list, number one or number two on every single one of those lists is money. And you have to understand that when you take on the responsibility of helping people, they are going to call you in their time of need and it's going to be an emotional time. So you have to be able to control your own emotions. And if you haven't healed or you have your own trauma and it bleeds into the workplace, which is it's inevitably probably going to because you haven't healed, it's okay you to get help. And I think uh, that's the first thing I like to level set when you say you're a financial advisor because you're inevitably going to have to deal with those types of emotions and money brings with with those things. And so I think it's actually a necessity as part of a high performing team. So as a professional, I think we need to get comfortable with the fact that everyone needs help. Like in order to be a, a high performer consistently, you need a team, right? And that's, I learned this from my, from my tennis days as a coach, as a player, and I was a player as well first before I was a coach, you know, as a player, and you look at Roger Federer or any professional athlete, not just tennis, but everyone has a team now surrounded by them to help them achieve peak performance. They have a physio coach, they have a mental coach, they have a stretching coach, and I separate physio and stretching because they're two different things. They have a meditation coach, they have a tennis coach, they have a serve coach within, like there's so much areas of specialization that they are specifically handled to equip, right? And it's no different if you're trying to be a, a, a peak performer in financial services. And exactly, and what I learned, you know, as I've, as I've gone through the industry now almost 10 years is that's actually what happens. You may not hear about it, but at those hedge funds, at those, you know, multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar firms, those executives, those people who are peak performers on a consistent basis, they have coaches. And I want you to actually change the word therapist to performance coach. Because that's, a, that, that's what a, a therapist can do for you. And there are therapists who are specifically charged with being performance coaches. They help you understand your gaps and where you your past experiences can, you know, help you or hurt you when you're delivering value to clients. And I think when I learned, and that's when I learned that that was a thing and that was really, and that was what helped me achieve you know, my peak performer as, a, as an advisor, as, a, as someone adding value to families, you know, for me, that's what really helped me heal was, okay, I'm going to hire this person because they are the key to me being a peak performer. And that was therapy. And then my therapist was the one to help me get into all these other areas of healing, which was, you know, making sure that you had a support system. And one of the learnings I had from that support system was understanding, and I think this is a key thing for anyone listening, is that your spouse, your family member, your close friends, they are not necessarily the ones to help you heal. They are not equipped to help you heal a lot of the times. And that was a big learning for me because if you expect them to be the ones, and that's, I think in, in society, we generally think that, okay, our close friends and our spouses, they are our spouses because they understand me. They can help me. They, they are there for me no matter what. And when they don't fulfill those responsibilities, because they are just ill-equipped, we actually see that as a fault of theirs. And that's 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 a huge thing that we need to, to get rid of. And I think that was a key learning for me and just in my relationships and my support and understanding what a true support system was and you know what therapy helped me realize was creating that support system that supported me. 
So having friends specifically there who could help me with specific things. My spouse was there to fill uh, certain things that she was fully equipped to, to do for me as my spouse and not to put these expectations on her or my my friends that they were there to help me heal when no that's not what they were they 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 helped me heal in certain ways but they weren't equipped they're not trained professionals they're not trained psychologists and that's fine and that's okay and i think that was a huge learning for me so a support system is definitely something that you need you need people there that are specifically equipped to support you in your healing journey and then I think the the third thing I'll say about, you know, what really helped me get to a place of healing was my environment, right? Putting myself in an environment to where I'm surrounded by achievers, by people who are empathetic, by people who ask a lot of questions rather than try to be the loudest voice in the room. You know, you see the habits and the behaviors of what you see as the the healthiest version for yourself. So that way you can then put yourself in those environments with other people who are who are either at that level or are always striving towards that level. Yeah, that's really helpful. Well, I'm afraid we're just about out of time, but I'd like to thank my guest, Mark Nichols, for being on the podcast and, and being so vulnerable with us about his experiences. Mark, thank you so much. I think folks that are have gone through similar situations will, will you know, find some hope in in your story here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and, and giving me a platform to to tell my story. And I hope it was valuable to to your listeners. Yeah. Um well if you if you'd like to reach out to Mark personally, you can um send him a direct message on LinkedIn. We'll put this in the show notes as well. And if you have a struggle and you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation. United Planners, an RIA and broker-dealer structured as a limited partnership, providing partners and associates an unfettered program to conduct fee-based and commission business for over 30 years. Advisors are offered the flexibility of being independent with a broad choice of custodians under the firm RIA or their own independent RIA.